one of the themes that was not scheduled for, for to be highlighted, but has definitely been highlighted over the course of our discussion these two days, is the complexity and diversity of China. And one of the ways, of course, that you can begin to get a sense of this is to go to China. But if you only go to the predictable places and get your Great Wall t-shirt, you're not, you're not going to have as rich an experience. And somebody who is now very much in the business of widening the horizons of visitors to China is our next speaker, Mei Zhang is going to be speaking. Yes, it's OK. <laughs> Applaud. <laughs> Absolutely. It's deserved. Now, she didn't come to this. Uh, she didn't you know, start out thinking this, this was going to be uh, you know, her life, her business, her mission. Uh, she grew up in Yunnan. She wound up at Harvard Business School, which is the obvious thing. Right? <laughs> Everybody in, in Yunnan thinks of, that that's where you're destined. Now, she, she went there. She worked as a consultant for McKinsey. She worked uh, helping the Nature uh, Conservancy. And in 2000, Wild China came into being. Uh, and this is an organization that takes people a bit off the beaten track and exposes them to a wider swath of China than they might otherwise discover. They eat different things, they have different experiences, and of course that affects what, what they know. It, ex, it affects what they think about China. Uh, more recently, she's also been doing this to help Chinese have a richer experience in the United States. Uh, I don't know uh, if, if, the, if the name of that branch is Wild America or not, but um, <laughs> there are places that are pretty wild and definitely worth, worth investigating. And so she has also written about her, uh, written a very interesting uh, book uh, that involved a leg of lamb. Ham. Ham, sorry. <laughs> I, gosh, it's in the title. It's in the title. And you're gonna have to wait to hear how that fits in. And she'll come and speak to you if you warmly welcome her. <laughs> May John. Thank you, Clay. That was um, a very kind introduction. Thank you, Clay. And thanks, everyone, for having me. I know I have the luxury of the slot after lunch, so we'll try to keep you awake. <laughs> All right. Um, I will talk about three things, but I think I'll start with a story about a young man called Alo. You'll meet him in a second. Then I'll talk a little bit about traditional tourism and what it looks like in China and what Wild China did to change that landscape a little bit. And then lastly, I'll talk about experience economy, experiential travel, that which I believe is going to be changing China for the long haul coming up. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why. First, the story about Alo. This happened, um, this map of China probably are all familiar, and this story is in this little southwest corner of China. Uh, I had some clients who went there hiking, and these clients a few years ago sent me a note right after they came back from the trip, and this was right before Christmas. The email goes, Dear May, we had a fantastic trip in Yunnan, but I don't know, US teachers receiving a note from parents who say, but <laughs> that transition usually causes a knot in the tummy. And I'm like, what is she going to say? And she said, but your guide's cell phone scared off all our birds. And I, my heart just jumped out of me. I'm like, how is that possible? This area, I'll show you. By the way, these, these clients are birdies, big birdies, um, uh, birders referred by Wen, Wendy Paulson and Hank Paulson. So they are very important clients of mine. So I wrote them a refund check after that. But I want to show you this area. This is now become China's Three Rivers National Park. And this is one of the river, the Sawin River, which if you refer to the earlier map, it flows straight out into Myanmar. And there's another river, which is the Mekong, that goes down and turns this direction and goes through 
Laos and Vietnam into the South China Sea. And the third river, which I did not mark, is the Yangtze River that goes out through the famous Three Gorges and Changjiang. So this whole region is incredibly beautiful. And when I first went there, it had no electricity because it was two days drive from the nearest airport. This was the local market. And uh, I think the old man's uh, walking his pigs. Um, so ham, you know, lamb, <laughs> pig, dog, <laughs> they're all sort of part of our husbandry. And um, interestingly enough, we're talking about, you know, ethnic community diversity in China. This whole region is Catholic. And they are ethnically Tibetans. So more than 100 years ago, at the turn of the last century, uh, the French fathers were trying to push the religion through Guangzhou and all the way towards Tibet, but stopped right around here because the mountains got too high. They were reaching 10,000 feet in elevation. Right. And these were the local uh, villagers who went to masses on Wednesdays and Sundays, and they would sing hymnals from a book that was published probably in 1920s in Tibetan. And it's just an incredibly odd, but extremely beautiful and peaceful sort of a society. And when this was an uh, image from 18 years ago when I first started the trip. And your experience there was you know, enjoying a basketball game. This was the hoop you can see up there in the local village. And our guides, this was Alua, right? So the whole town, the whole village had no electricity, no telephone except one in the village center. I wanted to do this hike, so I went there and I said, anyone's willing to guide me? And he had this incredibly trustworthy smile. And he said, I will. So I took him. And he you know, cooked for me, carried all my luggage with a pack horse. He told me stories about you know, his family. He told, explained to me how they use all the plants and the herbs. Generally, their life and his story, I thought it was this is the China I wanted people to see. This was the China experience that was very meaningful to me. And so I took that experience from that trip, went back to Beijing uh, with a few friends. We started Wild China. But what happened to him is, is what I wanted to tell you. It's much more interesting. He took away from the journey an idea, a realization that he did not have to live a life as a farmer for life. He said, maybe I can do something different. So he did. A year later, he called me up. I sent him like one or two more groups. A year later, he called me up. He said, I collected enough logs to build a guest house, but I don't have working capital. And I said, how much? A thousand dollars, because he will use all the labor from his friends in the village. I said, great, here's a thousand dollars and a slip of paper that he signed that gave me 40% of his equity. But th that was the capitalist in me. <laughs> okay. But in any event, so he, off he went. He built his lodge. And then he uh, um, called me a few months later and said, the lodge is done. Now I actually have a different telephone because I installed a telephone in my lodge. I said, great. Then he called me again from his cell phone. He says, now I have a cell phone. But I need you to help me with one thing. I need you to send me an intern. Help me work on the menu for my lodge fried eggs, and which is different from our Yunnan noodles. So we did. And then he asked for another intern to help him buy a computer, to help him um, figure out how to have a website for his lodge. He just went from there. And then he later on found me on Twitter, found me on Facebook. And then he found me on WeChat. So off he goes. Alois Lodge is now the number one lodge in this corner of the world on Lone and Planet. It, yes, plot for him. I, I think it's incredible how he took one sign of possibility and turned it into reality. But that is the story of over 18 years I've seen again and again. This is fairly recent WeChat updates. And look at this. He says, a picture a day. We walk through the northwest Yunnan where the three rivers converge, or not converge, go parallel. And this is the view of his travel services now. And on the right-hand side, he said, this is God's blessing to us. It's incredibly beautiful. We're surrounded by mainly snow mountain. 
and it just tells us how important it is to protect the environment. And this is the awakening of a Tibetan young man. And I feel travel in China is absolutely the opportunity to meet people like this and to hear stories as such. That is the real personal story of China. Right? So now I'll take you to see tourism in general. The alloy is a rare gem. There are a few people, there are quite a few actually like him. Now, China. How many have been there actually? Oh, so quite significant, almost half. Right. Um, this is the known China you s which you see in picture books. Absolutely beautiful, the Forbidden City and the Temple of Heaven, Three Gorges. And this is the real China when you are on site. <laughs> if you went there this summer, this, this would be the experience you have. Right. And, um, and I always felt this is not, like Clay said, this is not the only China. It's not the only narrative you want to have. But why is that? We dug back into the numbers to take a look. 85% of foreign travel nights are spent in 20% of China's land mass. If you look at it, because these numbers also include some of the manufacturing facilities, that's why the entire coastal region is all manufacturing facilities. But why these two pl places, Shanxi province and Chongqing? Shanxi is where she and the terracotta warrior soldiers are. And um, Chongqing is obviously the beginning of the Yangtze cruise. Yeah. So pretty much travel to China has limited in the blue areas, which means you get a one-sided story, right? What's the difference? This is the lady from the region which I just showed you, near Alor's area. And this is the life in Beijing mm -hmm. and Shanghai on a daily basis. And this is the contrast of a country so vast. This was true 20 years ago. This is still true today and probably even more true, more so, more sort of uh, gap between urban area and rural China. This is the opposite house hotel in Beijing. Incredibly chic modern art infused. And so majority of travelers when they get to China, this is what they get. And to me, that's not the way to see it with the red hats. And when they come here, they get the same thing, by the way, <laughs> uh, in front of the White House. So, so when I started the business, we decided, how, how can we change the way people travel? to make it more meaningful, a little bit different. One of the areas is we fundamentally believed tourist sites is, exist for a reason. Forbidden City, Great Wall exists because they are iconic. But that's not it. You have to go beyond it to really experience the country. Go to the homes, go to the villages, go to meet the locals. Right? And number two is you participate. Travel is something. You get as much out of it as you put in. If you hike, you know the land more. If you participate in planting the rice, next time you drop a piece of rice, you'll pick it up. Because uh, that happened to my kids. Right. <laughs> and learning. Infuse it. Infuse the journey with a lot of learning. Whatever form, whatever angle it is, Karen over there from the Berkeley Silk Road Tang Center they went to China. They learned one thing, right? The, the archaeology, Buddhism, culture along the, gro along the Silk Road, the Dunhuang area. But if you focus on that, it takes your focus away from the, the tourist crowds. Instead, what you learn all the rich culture and history has to share. Another thing we did was we get our clients out of the bus. Even if it's a school trip. We r once ran a school trip for an international school in Beijing, and they had 200 kids to go to Henan. And I'm like, no, we are used to dealing with kids. Uh, we're de dealing with people like five, 10 people. Uh oh, 10 minutes left. I'll, I'll get there. Um, and um, they had 200 people. What do we do? So cut it up into five different buses. Each bus had 40 kids. 40 kids, they rotate. They don't see each other on a different schedule. And then the 40 kids divided into 10 different groups, uh, 
sorry, four different groups, 10 kids each group, they rotate in activity so they could actually have an intimate experience. I think there's something in chemistry or physics that if you have an overwhelming body of people showing up in a village, you don't focus on the village, you focus on the internal dynamics. It, again, learning from my own kids as well. Um, and we skip all the trinket shops, the tourist shops. Who's been to like Southeast Asia or Egypt where your buses are forced to, to buy this next ring or uh, engraving? None of that. We just um, banned it. And the guides, I fundamentally believe everywhere you go, meeting the locals is one way to get really in touch with the local culture, but who will open the door for you? and the guides are really the windows uh, into a culture. So we encourage the guides to say, get off the script, get off the tourist the training guidebooks, tell personal stories, tell them how you grew up, tell them how you learned English, tell them uh, what is it like buying your first apartment. Those are the true stories that allow people to understand what's behind the New York Times. Right? And we, we are lucky enough that we could charge a little bit for this is Robert De Niro visiting, and John Wen came out to host him. Ah, and um, we're very honored and fortunate that to be featured in a case study at Harvard Business School. But what I wanted to show is the toilet seat on the right. <laughs> it's, it's a funny story, but traveling in China, some of the logistics comfort level is challenging. Nowadays, it's better. So for many, many years, we literally carried a toilet seat for those who cannot squat. So this is, was a toilet seat given to me by a client 10 years later, <laughs> which I thought great uh, with gold coins. And um, I don't want to sort of gloat on the, the successes, but I do want to say one thing. Because we banned the guys shopping in commission shops, we were the first ones in the industry to do so. In 2012, Chinese tourism law came out banning tourists um, commission shopping for guides and drivers, which was a huge change in the industry, which I think it's fantastic. If you could be at one drop that eventually cost flew into a stream, that's good enough for me. Um, now switch on to uh, experience the economy. Why China? I want to talk about experience. Is the picture is changing. When we started, most travelers were coming from outside China into China. And now it's the other reverse direction. Chinese are pouring into the world. And a lot of your students and you probably in your home city are experiencing the influx of Chinese travelers because the numbers are just growing. 2018, there will be 150 million visitors worldwide. That means half every other American is on the road. Right? That kind of number. And very interestingly, when Chinese traveler travel, it's sort of a travel industry development condensed in a 10-year time frame. The Chinese travelers go out there and seek experiences immediately. And this was a recent trip to Japan. These clients had sushi making lessons from a master, had uh, mocha tea tasting ceremonies from a master, and the Chinese travelers are gobbling this all up. And Chinese travelers are embracing Airbnb or all kinds of experiential travel like they've never been fed before. It's like th that level of hunger exists, uh, which is very natural when you look at the, the uh, progression of economic values. The very basic sort of um, group traveler experience is really at a deliver experience level. But when it goes further along, it's not, not enough. Punctually running a tour bus, you know, getting you onto the airplane, that's not enough to differentiate travel experiences. People are seeking for a richer experience. Therefore, staging experiences is now the differentiating factor in both the ones providing services in China for foreign travelers, as well as uh, those outside of China providing services for Chinese travelers. Now, in China, if you go, there are some must-have experiences. It takes a lot of trouble, which I'm sure you've already uh, heard in the past two days, right? WeChat Pay and uh, Mobike. We do get our clients, actually, 
install the app and write a mobile. So you could see that's what Chinese are living in the cities every day. Of course, the bullet train experiences, instead of flying, look at the map. This all showed up in the past 10 years. And it used to take this little distance. It used to take me two days, and now it's three hours. Right? From th this is Kunming to Beijing, used to be a 48 hour train ride, two day train ride, nonstop. I mean, with stops along the way, but you're on the train for 48 hours straight. Now it's eight hours. So that's the whole bullet train system that I think anybody going to China cannot not do. And you'd be surprised. There are tons of small designer lodges springing up everywhere in China, in small villages, places where I had to camp and sleep in people's homes. Now they look like this. This is uh, a new place in Guilin. Other experiences for which Clay uh, alluded to earlier, I went to these villages and wrote a book about these very local people who live everyday life, their tradition, this gentleman just makes ham with their locally made salt and they air dry it for two years. And it's this kind of experiences now Chinese travelers as well as visitors are willing to pay just for this chunk of, of experience, just to be with him for a day, make a leg of ham, which I think is fantastic. And this is a, um, not a visitor, but a service <coughs> provider in Dali who lives in the village, but cooks a fantastic meal for Chinese travelers. And you can go there too. He's French and Spanish, so he uses Dali ingredients and Dali mushroom and makes a um, European meal. Again, Chinese are willing to pay 288 kwai, $30 per person, to go for this meal. These, this is a couple featured in my book as well, and they simply take you to live with them for half a day. Harvesting vegetable with them, making handmade shoes, or cook, making cheese. Now, th these all seem surprising, but these are all local traditions in Yunnan. Cheese making, ham making. I know it doesn't sound very Chinese, but that's the, the, the culture there. And the reason she can't, the experiences are all at her house is because she has to care for these two people, a grandpa and a grandson. Um, which I think I personally love those kind of exper experiences with technology and uh, access of information. I really hope these individuals who are providing such experiences will be able to ride the next wave of experiential economy to really make a living. Um, challenges for non-Chinese speakers though. Uh, these innovations right now, because of the size of the market, they cater to Chinese travelers much more than to non-Chinese. Okay, one minute, last chart. Then the train system is very daunting for you to navigate yourself, for me as well. And we said that WeChat Pay and all these other apps require Chinese payment system. So those are the barriers for you to experience it. But once you get over that, I think it, you can really um, experience China more. The benefits to the rural China though, with all these changes, I mean you could see it really went from no electricity to everything's online in 18 years. Uh, also the awakening among the people, the call for conservation, uh, the general population's awareness for conservation is a lot higher than before. Um, and I'm a big proponent for having technologies to equalize access. So those villagers years ago that would have to rely on a travel services for us, like us to reach the market can now reach you directly, which I think is great. More opportunities for entrepreneurship, more opportunities for innovation. The choices, the possibilities are endless and I highly, highly encourage there's no better way to learn China than to get there. You, your students, I think can all benefit and the cross-cultural understanding can really benefit from it. So thank you, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. Uh, if you take a question or two. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I, I did want to say I have a sheet of a similar picture out there um, on the counter if anyone's interested later on.